What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content that I'm uploading onto my channel, then feel free to subscribe, and you can also offer suggestions on topics and characters and storylines and whatnot that we can have discussions on uh, later on in this channel. I am not a patient man. I've never been a patient man. I've, I've never had patience. From the time that I was a little kid up until right now, when I want something, I don't want it now, I want it right now. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't like waiting. I hate waiting on things. And I've been reading through Planet Hulk and I was like, hmm, I can't wait to do World War Hulk. So I was like, you know what we're gonna do? We're just gonna cover like everything in this video on Planet Hulk. We're gonna cover all the rest of the stuff. That way we can jump into World War Hulk because World War Hulk is stupidly good. Um, it is, it's insane how good it is. So uh, following the events of our first video, really like the first volume, the Planet Hulk event really began to, it was really Greg Pak taking this traditional standard on a multi-part series in the sense that um, you really had like, uh, in the beginning, you, you basically have the stage being set. That's usually how the first story arc goes. It sets the stage, it says, hey, here's the status quo. Um, and then there will be some kind of major conflict. And what that conflict will do is it will eliminate the existing status quo and it will begin a transition to the new status quo. And that's exactly what happened in our first video, you know, to, to kind of provide a little bit of a refresher there. With the first video, it was really just the Incredible Hulk being sent away from the planet Earth by the Illuminati because he was deemed to unpredictable. He crash landed on Sakaar. He was basically press ganged into the gladiatorial games and then eventually rose up against the Red King alongside the Silver Surfer. Now, the kicker about all this is that following the Incredible Hulk, uh, essentially defeating the immediate armies of the Red King and going out into Sakaar proper, he of course had his warbound, Korg and uh, Alloway and so on. But the idea was that his actions had inspired open rebellion among everybody else. Like all these slaves from across the planet uh, who were subservient to the Red King had looked to the Incredible Hulk as an example of the fact that they could attain their own freedom, whether it was through force or otherwise. And so in response to this, the Red King did the only thing he knew how to do. The Red King used force in order to try to maintain his control. Now, the cool thing about all this was that Kyra, his shadow, a member of the Old Strong, didn't really know the full spectrum of everything that had been going on. Instead, from her mind, she was a child being groomed to understand how the old power worked, uh, to be you know, being groomed to understand what her place was going to be as a warrior among her own group. The issue with this was that at some point along the line when she was a young girl, the spikes had suddenly attacked uh, her village and it resulted in the Red King basically, uh, you know, allowing the conflict to take place and then turning around and finding out who she was and then taking her as his own. Now, what Greg Pak's doing here is Greg Pak is using a really cool instance of something called game theory. And it works out really, really well with regards to this story. So game theory is, is literally just using like mathematical probability to determine the logical action that people will take. Uh, a really good example of this, or I guess in this particular instance, he's using something as like a leader. So um, to, to sidetrack for a second and bear with me here, because this may seem kind of out of left field, but let's say that like you're the leader of a territory, right? Let's say you're like the leader of uh, the United States of whatever your name is. <laughs> the United States of Comics Explained. Let's say you're the leader of the United States of Comics Explained and you learn that another country is going to attack you. Well, you have three options that are available to you. You can let the attack happen, you can stop the attack beforehand, or you can attack them before they attack you. Now, the idea here is under normal circumstances, attack them before they attack you or defend against the attack, make preparations uh, to keep your people safe. But if you did either of those, it would alert the enemy to what it is that you're doing. And so what you can do is you can let the attack happen. And then in turn, your people will rally under you. It's, it's one of the concepts of, of game theory. But the idea here is that the Red King did exactly that. The Red King had a motive here. The Red King was a child. He was an emperor. He wasn't really viewed as being someone that could be an effective leader. And so what he needed was someone at his side that could basically maintain the level of protection that he needed, but could also allow him to uh, have others look to him as a legitimate leader. And by going to one of the oldest races in the entirety of Sakaar's history and essentially allowing an attack on their group to happen, and then turning around and capturing the strongest of them, it forged an allegiance by force as opposed to, you know, diplomacy or something like that. But the basis behind this entire revelation was that Kyra had learned that the spikes were implemented by the Red King himself. It wasn't as though the spikes had simply just arrived in her village and attacked her. This had been orchestrated by the Red King. Now, something else to point out here is the Red King did not engineer the spikes. Instead, within the Marvel Universe, the spikes existed as basically like a, a sentient organism, and they literally just fed on cosmic energy. They would just traverse the spaceways and they would feed on energy. The problem with this was that during the rule of the Red King's father, the spikes had landed and then were eventually eliminated 
eliminated or removed from the planet by the Red King's father. They were essentially sent to the moon. The problem with this is that while they stayed in stasis for some time and they ended up turning to cannibalism in order to survive, the Red King harnessed the spikes for his own uses. And the Red King basically used the spikes to essentially get rid of communities uh, that had worked against him, to get rid of communities that were not functioning the way that he wanted them to or not uh, recognizing his rule as being legitimate. But in learning about this, Kyra had effectively turned against the Red King. She had turned against him, realizing that he was not an ally, that he was an enemy, that the lengths that he was willing to go to to try to defeat those who were standing against him was of such an extreme that he was actually willing to wipe out all life on the planet if it meant that nobody would challenge him. And so because of this, because of the fact that he was so extreme, because he was so dangerous, because of the fact that he had basically destroyed her people, Kyra had turned against the Red King and allied herself with the Incredible Hulk. And so what happened is Kyra, alongside the Hulk, as well as the remnants of the Warbound, basically went through and cut a swath. And I know you guys, <laughs> I know you guys love it when I say that, cut a swath through the uh, entirety of the Red King's army, eventually leading to his defeat. Now, in this original story, the way Greg Pak did it, it was presumed that the Red King had been killed. But of course, as we learned with regards to the uh, the origin of Scar himself uh, as the Incredible Hulk's son, that the Red King didn't die. The Red King instead was basically beaten to the edge of death and then eventually brought back by his own uh, wild bots. But what the story does, what these events do is they effectively pick up with the Incredible Hulk alongside Kyra, essentially creating their own way and, uh, and forming their own kingdom and the remnants of the Red King's rule. Now, the funny thing about this is with the Incredible Hulk and Kyra, they're almost one and the same in terms of how they view things in the sense that Kyra has been raised to be a warrior. And so she's the very definition of a warrior. In truth, she's really more akin to Thor than anybody else. But in the confines of this particular story, um, she wants peace to a degree, but she's also, you know, has no qualms killing those that get in her way. And the Incredible Hulk is the exact same way. But the other half of this coin is that when the Incredible Hulk first showed up on Sakaar as part of the Planet Hulk event, he wanted to leave. He didn't want to have anything to do with these guys here. He didn't want to have anything to do with forming a war bound or, or basically leading the inhabitants to salvation. But the way this worked is that he was viewed as essentially being the Sakarson. That is to say, basically the savior of Sakaar. Uh, whenever he bled, it ended up growing plants on the surface. And so it really allowed the civilizations that were here to look at him as uh, quite literally their messianic figure, a guy that was going to lead them into a much greater tomorrow. Now, eventually the Incredible Hulk actually takes this role on alongside with Kyra, and he basically looks at himself as a king with her as his queen. More so than that, he's also met with Meek. Now, the cool thing about this when it comes to Meek's character is he had basically helped some of his people who had been held captive to escape uh, into freedom, but in the process had actually undergone this transformation, basically making him the king and allowing him to uh, get with their queen and do what they do in order to create offspring. Um, the queen's not much to look at, but <laughs> it works within the confines of their own race here. But the other half of this is that they're very much in the middle of cleaning up here. They're very much in the middle of uh, getting everything sorted out. Now, with regards to the conversation between the Incredible Hulk and Kyra, this is why I say it's such an important part of his character is because when he takes her and they go on somewhat of a journey where they go to basically like the steps of Sakaar, which is this sort of proving ground slash, you know, peaceful, uh, harmonic place, the two of them begin to talk. And the Incredible Hulk says that all he was bred for is the Destruction. I mean, when, when the Incredible Hulk existed on Earth, all he did was just destroy things. Now, again, a lot of this was because the Incredible Hulk wanted to be left alone, but it didn't change the fact that the Incredible Hulk always was destructive by nature, hence the reason he was sent away by the Illuminati. Whenever he looks at the entire history of his time on Sakaar, he looks at the events as they've unfolded throughout the entire Planet Hulk event, all he sees is a continuation of the pattern that he had on Earth, and that wherever he goes, destruction will follow him. But Kyra looks at him and says, this is not the case. You know, when you bleed, it grows plant life and look at the life that you've created. He's basically restore the planet. He's in the process of terraforming the planet just because of his blood. And so what he's done is he's given all the civilizations on Sakaar hope. He's given them a future to look forward to. And because of this, his life, while on earth, he may very well have been a force of destruction on Sakaar, he's a savior in every ounce of the word. Now, this is huge for the Incredible Hulk. And this is why Greg Pak's writing of Planet Hulk is so good because we've never never really seen an instance like this. It's one of the reasons why I love the Incredible Hulk. We'd never seen him written in such a way to where he was more of a savior than a destroyer. Now, a lot of that was because of the fact that, you know, within the confines of his role on Earth, he was just kind of a bumbling buffoon that was, it was, he was a bull in a china shop. It's really the best way to describe the Incredible Hulk on Earth. And it worked in a lot of situations because we got to see him go against some various, you know, heroes and, you know, even more so with villains, it was kind of like, well, if things aren't going our way, call on the Hulk, he'll solve our problem, then we'll send him away. Uh, it was, it was really interesting 
interesting in how it was done, but it didn't add a lot of character depth. The most depth we ever really got was during Peter David's run when it came to the Incredible Hulk's history, his abusive father, so on and so forth, and why the Hulk persona manifested when Banner was blasted with gamma rays, but that was about it. There was really no huge exploration into his character. The cool thing about this, though, is that we get that in this story. We get so much depth with regards to the Incredible Hulk, you know, I guess to such an extreme that he actually changes his tune. You know, he tells Kyrie, yeah, you're right. You know, I am a savior here. I am a person here that can literally lead all these different races to a much better tomorrow. And so he, alongside Kyra and everybody else here, begins the process of cleaning up, begins the process of getting things sorted out. Now, what we also learn is that there is some trouble in paradise. You know, there are individuals that look at the Incredible Hulk, LOA especially, and says, he's not that different from the Red King. The Red King used us as slaves to build his kingdom, and it seems like the Incredible Hulk's doing the same thing. Now, we as the reader know this is not the case. All we know is that the Incredible Hulk is just making them apply a little bit of elbow grease, and that it's really one of these situations where everybody has to chip in in order to make everything better. You know, it's not something where the Incredible Hulk can just fix everything. More so than that, there's a reward to this. You know, once they finish uh, rebuilding, once they finish clearing all this debris out, once they finish restructuring and making the kingdom their own, they can sit back at their handiwork and say, this is ours. You know, something earned is far more significant than something given. And so the idea here is that they're effectively earning their place in this kingdom. They're earning the right to say, we made this, as opposed to, well, we just toppled the Red King, everything stayed intact, and then we just occupied the kingdom. It really establishes them as being part and parcel to this entire area itself. And so from here, we really have this kind of conclusion with regards to the idea of the spikes. And this really just kind of ties in. It's really just Greg Pak, you know, eliminating these last few things in the sense that these various spike ships that had been confined to the moon uh, that hadn't quite been harnessed by the Red King, this ultimately led to the Incredible Hulk traveling to the moon and freeing all the spikes and allowing them to go back about their business, uh, traversing the spaceways. And so it's literally just kind of him fulfilling these last few packs, fulfilling these last few agreements, you know, solidifying the fact that the Incredible Hulk is a true, legitimate, and benign leader over the people in, uh, in Sakaar. The problem with this is is that as they begin to celebrate, once everything begins to get put together, you know, once everything begins to come back to normal, we suddenly find that this is the ship or the shuttle that the Incredible Hulk had been brought in begins to start beeping. Now, the idea was to turn this shuttle into somewhat of a monument to basically make it a testament to the fact that the Incredible Hulk had been sent here as a Sakarsan. He had uh, liberated them all and ushered them into freedom. And because of the fact that this thing starts beeping, we basically learn that this is a warp core meltdown, that the nuclear core of this ship is beginning to break down, it's beginning to detonate. And so the Incredible Hulk does what he can to try to protect those around him, you know, especially Kyra, who's currently pregnant with her child. But the result is that there's really nothing he can do. This nuclear powered, really bomb, for lack of a better word, uh, essentially explodes and it destroys all everything in the crown city everything and almost everyone the only people who aren't killed here are those individuals those people who are part of his warbound uh heroim korg those people who are basically sent away from the crown city in order to begin the process of creating diplomatic ties with other civilizations other tribes around the planet in order to ensure that they uh you know that they don't really recognize the incredible hulk as their king so much as they see him as the new ruler of crown city and someone with which they can have diplomatic relations with and so because they're they're not currently present, they become aware of what's going on. They realize that the Crown City has been destroyed in a nuclear blast, but for them, they don't know why. They don't really understand why. But the more important thing about this is Greg Pak is setting the stage here. With the Incredible Hulk as a character, and this, this is one of the reasons why I loved the, the end of Planet Hulk so much, because this, this is why I say there's so much development. With the Incredible Hulk as a character, all he's known is disappointment. I mean, that's the story of his life, let down after let down. Superheroes claim to be his friends, and then they betray him. Villains use him for their own ends. Humanity is constantly hunting him down. The Incredible Hulk's life was just nothing but a sad tale. You know, Bruce Banner's father was an extremely abusive man, you know, more so to the point that is believed that Bruce Banner himself developed multiple personalities. And so when he was blasted with the gamma bomb that led to the formation of the Incredible Hulk, the Incredible Hulk is just the physical manifestation of his anger towards his father, his rage against humanity, you know, his hatred against all things or anything that would try to do harm against Banner himself. It's really like a physical manifestation of his psychological desire to stay protected from everything in the world that would harm him. And so the idea is that leaving Earth and being sent on Sakaar for the first time gave the Incredible Hulk 
purpose. It gave him a place that he believed he can call his own. And the Incredible Hulk says this, you know, he says, look, when I was here, I thought I had a place. I, I believed this could be something real. I believed it could be something true. I believed that I could really look out onto the horizon of a rising sun and see a better tomorrow. But he says, I was foolish to believe this. I was foolish to believe that I would find anything but death and destruction everywhere I go. Now, as we know with our origin story of Scar, this was the moment whereby Kyra had basically sent her unborn son uh, into the planet in order to basically be saved from the presumed destruction of, uh, of Sakaar, and he would uh, essentially emerge. And so these last few moments of the Incredible Hulk on this planet are around the time that his son is emerging and beginning to come into his own in terms of encountering these various species and so on uh, that are you know part of the planet itself, part of the indigenous life. But then suddenly the Incredible Hulk is also met with the remainder of his warbound, with Korg, Heroin, Meek, so on. And initially the Incredible Hulk wants to be left alone because he's quite literally a grieving guy here. But as we know with the stages of grief, at first it's denial. It's denial of the fact that those individuals around that, that we lose are dead. It's the idea, well, they'll, you know, somehow something will happen, things will change, we can get things back to the way they were before. After that, it leads to anger. And this is the Incredible Hulk angry. This is him about as mad as he's ever going to be. And so he, alongside with his warbound, prepare. They prepare for an invasion of Earth. They begin the process of forming arms and armament for a full-on invasion and destruction of those who did the Incredible Hulk harm. And so in effect, at the beginning of World War Hulk, the end of the Planet Hulk storyline, what we have here is Bruce Banner with the wrath of God. It is... <laughs> God is a sight to behold. <laughs> Dude, I almost want to just like crank out World War Hulk right now. Like, ugh, like this, this is, man, this is, <laughs> oh, can you guys feel it? Can you feel the excitement? Like this is, this, I love this story so much because really Planet Hulk is just like one giant prelude to World War Hulk. But at the same time, like, I was in the Incredible Hulk's corner the entire event. I mean, let's let's have this little bit of a discussion about World War Hulk for a second. I was in the Incredible Hulk's corner with regards to World War Hulk. I was in his side because I was like, yeah, man, like humanity's done nothing but dick you over Incredible Hulk. Let's get some revenge, dude. Let's kill some folks. Let's go ahead and remind humanity of their place in the bigger picture. Like, let's remind them where they stand because it's not on an even playing field with you, man. Like I was, <laughs> I was like, let's do this. But uh, because I'm so hyped, we're gonna go ahead and cover World War Hulk. Uh, in the next video. We'll go ahead and just kick off World War Hulk. But uh, but yeah, guys, like I really hope you all enjoy this Planet Hulk series so far. Um, There are a few things here and there that we didn't really cover. I know there's gonna be some people who want some of that stuff covered. We may or may not do that at a future point in time, but in truth, it wasn't really relevant to the story per se. Um, It was really just something we could kind of gloss over and then get to the meat and potatoes of Planet Hulk. Because I kind of think the stuff that we ran over in this video was far more significant in terms of the development of the Hulk. Because again, my aim here was to basically show you guys the evolution of Bruce Banner from being sent to Earth, residing on Planet Hulk, Hulk, the things he gained and then in turn lost, and why he's so angry and why he ends up coming back to uh, Earth and literally waging a one-man war against the superheroes of the planet. But with that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end, and uh, if you guys are new here to Comics Explained, be sure to hit the subscribe button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, drop a like and leave a comment down below, and I will catch you all later. Peace.